uh, join in. So yeah, how, how have you, let's start with kind of how have you been doing through all of this, right? I mean, I'm sure for you as with everybody else, everything changed in March and it's been four months of, you know, craziness, right? <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's definitely a wild world right now. Um, but I have been, you know, I've been pretty chill. It's just me and my dog, you know, kind of doing the quarantine thing and a lot of this, a lot of Zoom meeting, a lot of Zoom jamming, a lot of, uh, you know, I, I mean, I could say that, oh, I'm, you know, I'll use the time to write. I'll write my ass off like all day long, all night long. But even that gets like kind of boring after a while, you know, you gotta take a break from the computer sometimes. So lots of hikes with my dog um you know just playing guitar a lot uh yard work household projects yeah uh, but 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 overall i'm good you know mental and, state seems okay for the most good. part so tell me about the zoom jamming like how does that work for, for you guys how do you kind of flesh ideas out um, as you're jamming through zoom um the Zoom thing is, it, it, it doesn't really work well because there's a little bit of lag. So any of the Zoom jams that we do are usually have to be kind of edited together, which, you know, we'll, we'll play, one person will play, send it to the next person, that person will play, and then later on it'll get edited up. Um, unfortunately, I wish we could jam just like me and you right now, like we are, but there's a little lag and it doesn't work out. But, um, you know, there's still a lot of writing going on uh, via email because I could literally you know, I could send MP3s to anybody all over the world and, and we can kind of uh, collaborate on music together just that way, which is really cool. Um, like I said, it, it gets old though. <laughs> yeah. find something else to do. Is that something you guys have done in the past, you know, kind of sending the files back and forth? And Yeah, for, for writing, definitely, yeah. We've yeah. been doing that for a while now. It's just a little extra now. Yeah, and where are you located? I'm in Southern California, a town called Riverside. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm up north in Napa, so. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm between like LA and Palm Springs, like right, right in the middle. Yeah, and so uh, so tell me a little, little bit of, about your most recent video that you uh, put out. I mean, it's uh, everything, the, everything she wants covered by Wham. You guys went all out and yeah. you, I mean, in this time speaking, where we're talking- Speaking of Zoom jams. Right? I mean, so, <laughs> I mean, this is the uh, epic Zoom, Zoom jam, right? Like you guys got, you know, you guys obviously made a lot of calls, got, uh, asked a lot of yeah. favorites in, in this video. Tell me about that process. Uh, it, was, it was fun. You know, I mean, we, we, we've been, we signed a record deal with Megaforce Records, you know, uh, the end of last year. And, and we've just been basically kind of hunkered down, working on new music. We had four songs that we had recorded and mixed and mastered and we were off to writing other stuff. One of those songs was the cover. Um, just because we'd been messing with it and it really worked out well, it's just punchy and it translates well and it still has a lot of emotion. So it kind of fell into that keeper category like Smooth Criminal did back in the day because we play a lot of covers. But you know, the, the idea came up that we should put a song out during this whole thing just to kind of keep a presence. Um, you know, raise awareness that we're still alive and kicking and, and, and more than anything, just to kind of maybe inject some, some smiles and happiness into the world when it needs it the most, I guess. Um, or, you know, I, some people might get mad and punch the hole in the drywall when they hear us, who knows, but uh, let's hope for the, for the other, but uh um, yeah, so we were like, hey, uh, you know, if we're going to put this out, obviously we got to put a, a a video together, you know, if we're just going to do a lyric video or what are we going to do? And then, you know, with all of us and everybody doing these like kind of Zoom split screen jams, we were like, why don't we just do that? And uh, while everybody's quarantined still and and let's put out a cattle call to all of our fans and friends and family and while we're at it, let's hit up some friends that we know in bands, you know, people that we have history with or that we've toured with or we're just friends in one way or another. And uh, everybody came back good. It was literally like too, many, too much people, you know, like I, I think we tried to, I think we had over 200 submissions and tried to cram all that into the video. So, um, you know, hats off to 
to the guy who edited the video because <laughs> yeah, he did a good job putting it all together, you know, and and um, and it was cool. It was a fun thing to do. I mean, it it, it was cool because it wasn't a ton of work for us other than recording a performance at home and then reaching out to friends and stuff. But it it it, it, it played on. It, I, I'd say it played on my on my attitude a little bit just because you got to know who like which of your friends are like kind of into having a good time and don't take themselves too seriously. Um, and then the ones that do, <laughs> yeah. so it was kind of like, you know, I'm not going to take it personally. I'm just going to go, Hey, this guy is just might take himself a little too seriously. And that's okay, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so there's a lot I want to explore and kind of what we've already started talking about, but let's start with Megaforce records. I mean, tell me about that relationship and, uh, and how it's been and really how it came about for you guys. Well, um, it's really cool and, and kind of classic and awesome because we, most of us in the band kind of grew up on Megaforce records and their bands um, in the early days, you know, I'm a metal kid uh so like half the bands i listened to were either on megaforce or metal blade you know um or nuclear blast or whatever you have you know but uh yeah i used to sit and like just stare at those record covers when i was a kid so it's like even the even the record label like logo on the back or whatever um so it was really kind of cool and novel. I, obviously, Megaforce has become way more than just a metal label now. I mean, we're label mates now with Bad Brains to Bjork. You know, it's just lots of, they have a pretty diversified um, stable nowadays. Um, and, and, and I actually knew Missy, uh, the, the owner, uh, you know, she took it over for, uh, uh, from the uh, Zazulas, from John and Marsha Z. Um, and I had done, I had done a couple, she, she was working with that band Fuel for a while. And I yeah. did a couple of videos for them and ultimately for her label back in the day. This was years ago. But so yeah. her and I already had a little bit of a relationship. And then uh, we recently just got a, you know, last year got our, our new management in place. And, and we have the same management as Anthrax uh, currently. So, and P.O.D., and uh but but the anthrax connection was the kind of the shoe in to get us in with missy and megaforce and uh and, and i couldn't be happier i think it's just like a great fit and and so far so good man they've been really um open and uh willing you know to to hear us out and go for things that we're interested in yeah and so do you uh i mean my understanding from what i've read is you guys have an album you're kind of ready and to get out is that kind of where it's uh, not quite it's there's still a lot of work to be done uh but that's what we're doing i mean when, when this whole thing went down with the quarantine and everything it just kind of halted production um as far as recording and you know getting getting production done for the actual record uh so now it's just kind of back to the writing you know uh, like we talked about before via email but you know we're stockpiling tons of music and once we can actually get into like a real studio and kind of figure out what we're doing and we're, we're looking for some, uh, some, uh, we have producers we're working for or we're working with, but we're always looking for other produ producers to work with too, you know, just to mix it up a little. Yeah. What were some of the pro producers that you've enjoyed working with over the, uh, the time that you've been in? Doing oh my gosh. Uh, well, obviously, like the when we did True, we did it with with Robert and Dean DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah. Um, they were great in every way. I mean, I learned so much from those sessions. Like they rammed me through guitar college. Um, you know, uh, I I probably being that both of those guys are like excellent guitar players, and and like um, gear junkies. I really, I got ran through the meat grinder on that record. So I learned a lot, which is cool. Um, you know, and not just about being a musician or a guitar player, but being like a, just a good human or whatever, you know, I try. Um, so that was really cool. That was like working with your heroes, you know? And, uh, and not only that, when we finally got with it, we spent a lot of time with those guys, you know, from pre-production to the studio sessions and, and, um, you know, those guys have just as ridiculous a sense of humor as we do. And it was a perfect fit. 
So yeah, Robert and Gene, that was probably my 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 favorite that we've ever done. But we've we've had opportunities to work with like Brendan O'Brien and and people like Johnny K and and um, you know it, it, it's all it's all good learning. That's for sure. Yeah, and you, I know this. You even learn what not to do. So what are, what have you learned not to do? <laughs> what are, what are some um, of, like okay, not going to do that. Don't again. don't let record people in the studio too much. Yeah, they get they take over control, and then you don't get to do. You know, well, make right especially away. if they're like that record dude that fancies themselves as like a producer type or whatever. They're in there just their own ideas and kind of halting up the whole process. I've seen it happen a million times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Some what, of my record dudes friends are going to be like, "You're an asshole." Yeah. So I, I want to talk to you a little. I mean, just as we're talking about producers and everything, I mean, this is a period you weren't with the band, but uh, but Alien Ant Farm worked with uh, Jim Wirt. Yeah. Which he produced uh, actually my favorite album, which was uh, Jack's Mannequins, Everything in Transit. Jack's and Mannequin. Wow. Right around the same time. You know, and oh wow, yeah, yeah, I know Jim well. Um, because I, although I wasn't on that record, we did all we cut our teeth as a young band with Jim Wirt in his studio in Fourth Street, uh, recording in Santa Monica, California. That guy taught us how to be a band, <coughs> excuse me, literally. Um, because we used to do, um, there's a guy that just passed away, rest in peace, Len Fagan, who was, uh, He's just an industry standard, like a great underground dude in the Hollywood, LA music scene. Famous dude, worked for like Chrysalis Records back in the day. Uh, when we were a young band, he was, the, he was the main booker at a club in California in Hollywood called the Coconut Teaser. That was really kind of like, it was one of the main cool places to play on the Sunset Strip. Um, now he, he, saw, he booked us, he saw us, he liked us so much that he gave us a, a like a residency there for a month where we played every Monday night um, early to an empty room basically, but he would bring in, you know, record people that he knew. Um, so he brought in Jim and Jim loved us. And, uh, and the rest is kind of history, man. After that, Jim, Jim was like, come to my studio. We went down to, to Fourth Street and started making music with Jim. And, uh, and, you know, we're lifelong friends. I love Jim. And we st he still comes to our shows. I think he's in, uh, he's in uh, Missouri nowadays. Uh, so whenever we go on, the, when we were touring, whenever we get in that area, he always makes a, a point to come down and, and uh, see the show or say hi and sit on the bus. And I love Jim. He's a good guy, man. He's a really talented guy, too. And I, I would absolutely love working with Jim again. Yeah. So what did you learn for, uh, from working with him? What are some of the takeaways of the, you know, the time that you Well, we were, we were a super young band when we were working with Jim, you know, when we first started working with Jim. So, I mean, Jim, Jim taught us a lot about arrangement, um, you know, uh, how to make a good hook. You know, he taught us a lot about harmony singing, like a lot of fundamental stuff that maybe we had a grip on, but he showed us how it really works in the record business in a, uh, in a recording studio um yeah. and, and and that just kind of set us up for a lifelong recording career so yeah. he taught he taught us a lot man yeah so let's go back a little bit well oh he taught us how to make a a, a gravity bong out of a two liter uh seven up bottle too that was cool well that's a good lesson too so that's good <laughs> So, so tell me for you, what music was on in your house when you grew up? Like, what, what did your parents listen to? What, what were some of the influences that kind of got you started in music? And oh, good question. Um, as uh, you know, my mom, my mom's side, my dad, my dad's from Italy. Um, so you know, he he, there wasn't a lot of influence going on from there. He used to play a lot of traditional Italian music in in the house, but. When I was a kid, I wasn't really picking up on it, but <coughs> excuse me, COVID. Um, right. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, That's too, too yeah, right. Uh, so my mom, being from Texas, uh, you know, she was kind of a rock chick. She grew up in the 70s, but had like flair for country western as well. Um, so I was getting a lot of records from her. 
Now I was getting, uh, I remember specific records that I got from her that I really loved, like Led Zeppelin II. Um, Heart, Dog and the Butterfly was a great one. Um, you know, some Cream records, some uh, good, just a lot of classic rock stuff. My mom was, was, she had a good record collection when I was a kid, so. And of course I found her one Kiss record and it was all over. It was done. Know, at that point. Yeah, I was done. I was like, I was like every member of Kiss for like the next four Halloweens or whatever. Anyways, <laughs> but you know, one, one um, big influence of mine, I'm not the biggest country Western dude, but when I w was growing up at a very young age, I used to, I used to, uh, my mom would work and she'd dump me on my grandma. So I'd hang out in my grandmother's house most of the day. And my grandmother, while she was working in the kitchen or doing whatever she did, she was always cranking classic outlaw country. So I was like, I got exposed to like the um, Conway Twitties and and uh, Merle Haggards and and uh, George Jones and and even uh, you know uh, I came away with a big love of Glenn Campbell uh, as a guitarist. You know, Glenn Campbell was extremely one of the greats and and so you know i have like that flair too from my grandma kind of kind of cranking that stuff you know um but that that's that's pretty much it my mom's classic rock albums are kind of what set me on my course i'd say yeah who gave you your first guitar when did you when did uh, that catch you you know what's funny is actually um my first guitar was a loner um what happened was I, I played on a junior tackle football team when I was a kid. Uh, and there was another kid on the team and his dad was one of the coaches. Now this kid, his name was Vic Sika. And he was, we were kids, man, but this kid had a full beard. He was like the only kid on the whole team that had like a beard. And uh, so, you know, he just like, everybody looked up to him cause he seemed like this older kind of more wisdom kind of guy. And uh since his dad was a coach, they used to have like team functions at, at their house, uh, whether it was a barbecue or a meeting or parent meeting or whatever it was. Um, so I remember being at his house the first time and he's all, come here, check it out. And he t leads me to his room and in his room, he's got an amp and a guitar, like just a little cheapy combo and a cheapy like court guitar or some shit. And, uh, and I was just like, even just, I picked it up and held it. And I was just like enamored. And uh, I had no idea what to do with it, but he, he literally on the spot played the, the four chords for Living After Midnight by J Judas Priest, you know, and showed them to me on the spot. And, and I was just off running from there. Yeah. So what happened was I had another friend named Shig um, who I went to school with. And uh, he had like a cool wood grain flying V and an amp. And we used to hang out at his house and he never played. He was like, uh, my dad got it for me. And, you know, he, <laughs> he had just a flying V, but he never played it. Yeah, he wasn't really about it. I don't know. Yeah. I was like, let me borrow it. So he like, without his parents' knowledge, like let me borrow this guitar and the amp. So for like three months, I had that flying V and an amp up in my mom's apartment. And I was just going crazy trying to learn stuff, you know, until finally <laughs> uh, knock at my door and I open it and it's Shig and his mom. And she's like, I want Shig's guitar back in his amp. <laughs> so they took that back. Then what happened, uh, once again, my grandmother to the rescue, um, God, she was a saint, rest her soul. Um, she was so supportive of me. But she took me down to a place called Corona Norco Music and put a, it was, it was a, a, a Randy Rhodes Flying V made by a, a company called Arbor. It was a knockoff, but, but um, we put that on layaway and I waited like three or four months for it, man. I, I counted every minute. Yeah. I wish I still had the guitar. What happened to it? I don't know. No, just dis disappeared some way, huh? So and, it's not the it's not the only guitar that's just disappeared. <laughs> and was it always the guitar for you that you that you just latched onto? Were there other uh, instruments that you? you know, I started you... I started on in drum lessons. Okay. Yeah, my mom put me in drum lessons real early, and I I didn't really take to that. Um, 
you know, I, I thought it was more fun to just like air drum to kiss in my room or whatever, you know, I was never really learning my um, lessons. And, uh, and that just kind of went out the window, I lost track of it. And then I went into like sports for a while, you know, like I played junior tackle football where I met the guitar dude, you know. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it was it was drums first and guitar. We always had a piano in the house. Uh, I could play some, I could pick things out. Uh, you know, I could play obviously like with guitar comes bass. Uh, I could play a little drums. Uh, you know, I, I I could figure most instruments out if I pick it up. I can't, I won't say I'd be good at it, but I can figure out how it works fundamentally, you know? You put something out there that I don't hear very much, Terry, and that is my mom got me drum lessons. Now, parents don't often get their kids drum lessons like proactively, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, shooting yourself in the foot. Right, that's the instrument we're bringing into the home? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But your mom all I had was one snare drum, though. My mom got me a snare drum, and I had a practice pad, and that was all I had. So I never got any more raucous than that. Yeah. Which no, a snare no. drum sounds like a damn gunshot, so. <laughs> Just repeatedly, though. I mean, still, right? Like, I mean, for her to initiate that, she must have been really, a really big supporter of you. Yeah, my, my mom and my grandma were, they were everything. When I was coming up, they, they really encouraged me and, and um, set me on my course. Yeah. Uh, so we have to obviously talk about anthology, right? Uh, so tell me, tell me how that, uh, you know, when that exploded, how did that change your life? What, you know, the impact of that album? Well, we got a better bus. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it was an accelerated process, man. It was very fast and we didn't even know what to do with it all at set B because we're we're kind of just I don't know we're not I I don't know if you've ever taken it away from us but we we're not like the most serious band like as far as taking ourselves seriously like we're we're good at just being like goofy goofy like acting like we're 12 year olds yeah. um so um you know we were out there just having fun and going crazy and we had movies was in the top 10 and then K rock New York decided to play smooth criminal. And, and, uh, obviously them being a top five trend setting station, it just, it was a brush fire. You know what I mean? So yeah. it went so crazy so fast that we just rolled with it. You know, um, it, it, I don't even think we knew how lucky we were, uh, but it, it definitely changed a lot of things. Sizes of crowds, guarantees went up. Uh, like I said, we did get a better bus. We got better tours, um, you know, better festivals, stuff like that. Uh, with radio success, you get a, all of a sudden you're playing all these radio festivals all year long that are like giant arena shows, you know, and stadiums and shit like that. So it was, a, it was quite the accelerated process. Yeah. And um, and so uh, it, talking about the arena shows and that explosion, like were you ever nervous in front of the you know crowds of that size, or was it a comfortable kind of situation for you? Not as not as nervous as anxious. I think I'm still to this day more anxious about playing shows. I I, I wouldn't. I guess that's a sort of of fear. You know what I mean? Like uh, I I'm more like anxious to get out there and kill it and and be on the other side with no hangups, you know, with no hiccups or problems, like a, like a flawless set or as yeah. close to flawless as we can get. That's what I'm anxious to get to the other side of the set. You know what I mean? But, but everything in the middle is just muscle memory and, and, um, adrenaline. Uh, but yeah, it's, I don't, I don't know that there was ever a nervousness. It was more excitement. You look out the curtain or from backstage and you see all those people and it's you it's gonna affect you, but it didn't make me scared. It made me like anxious, like ready to to go. Yeah. Like, let's, let's get out there and get this over with in a way. Not that I don't enjoy being on stage, it's just you really strive for that flawless, you know, set. Yeah. And I'm sure it gives you this high that, you know, isn't able to be reproduced in a lot of different yeah, so, it's, that's right. a trip. it's a trip. Yeah. And that's, yeah. A, that, you know, that's a, a lot of people don't understand like that adrenaline rush is like, 
it's it's extreme and 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 all the appreciation that comes with it too which leads me to talk about like you know you've heard of like uh like you know mental issues and 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 problems with like entertainers and, and musicians who who go through all this adoration you know and, and adrenaline and stuff and then three hours later they're alone in a hotel room you know what i mean and like watching cold case files or some shit you know and it's a it's a hell of an up and down yeah it's something you really got to get used to or or it'll it'll fuck with your head totally and and so how how soon after k-rock started playing the um smooth criminal did the did you guys make the video and then that kind of really ex exponentially took things off to mtv yeah. all that right yeah it was fairly immediate i mean i remember i think they were even pulling us off tours to go make the video at the time because it it was essential to in the time frame um and and no one was really expecting uh smooth criminal to go off like that so um the video yeah that i remember they brought us back and they they basically like shut down a block in van nuys california and we used like three or four houses because in la people put their houses on lists to get used for movies and videos and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so we just took a whole neighborhood and, and uh, made this video. And we made it pretty quickly, you know, it was, we, 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 we did the video, it was one of three or four videos that we did with Mark Klausfeld. And Mark Klausfeld, we hit it off very well with him. Again, he was not afraid to get super juvenile and goofy with shit. So that's where we clicked and we, we just like our, our creative meetings were very fast moving and, and just kind of instances where we made each other laugh. And then we, we, you know, his producer would make all the notes and then we'd go and flesh it out. And, uh, and so it was a pretty quick, it was a pretty quick process, man. We blew that video out in probably like three days. Wow. And you worked with Michael's team a little bit on that too, right? Like they had, uh i mean they saw it or how did that process uh, we we corresponded with his people and him uh because we didn't we wanted to we wanted to pay homage in a way you know we didn't want to we didn't want to come across like we were making fun of him and i yeah. think that he really appreciated that so he let us in and he started kind of consulting on things here and there <laughs> and, and i think the funniest thing to come from it was that kid that's dancing with the mask on yeah yeah uh, like uh you know, Michael, when he first saw that, he asked us to take the mask away. He didn't want us to, to emphasize that. And, uh, and so we reshot the whole scene and sent it to him, no mask. And he hit us up and told us to put the mask back. <laughs> he was, yeah, he was like, he was like, it's better with the mask. Like it's more gettable. And yeah. uh, so that, hey, hey, that totally takes me back to like, what I was saying about some artists being a little too into themselves or taking themselves too seriously. If yeah, they, yeah. if you're, if you take yourself too seriously to be an alien ant farms, wham video, then just think of, 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 uh, Michael Jackson, like actually selflessly kind of, you know, uh, giving us that, you know, yeah. like he kind of, he took it on the chin in a way, you know, he was, he was not too into himself to demand that mask be out. And he knew, for the art that it should be there and he let us he let it fly so that was kind of cool yeah uh so tell me about the dynamic of where uh, the band is right now um i've i've heard uh, drayden say in interviews you know that there have been times where the band hasn't gotten along so well but are you guys driving are you guys doing well uh we're we're on and off like any family man i mean me mike and dryden have known each other since we were teenagers so um we're we're brothers and it's it's just gonna be like that it's like any sibling family kind of situation and and uh but you know we're all in our 40s also so it's you know we we catch ourselves and and you know we we, we we're really good at making up the next day that kind of shit but even that gets old but uh um you know right now everyone's just kind of like a little scattered as far as you know, um, tending to their families and their households, or quarantining or whatever they need to do, you know, I I tend to stay away a, a little bit. I have a 78 year old father who has COPD, and and uh, so I'm trying to kind of stay away from everybody in a way. But you know, now we're we're recent 
<clears throat> we're trickling back into rehearsals now because on Saturday we're doing a live cast uh, show from the whiskey in Hollywood. You were probably going to ask me about that, huh? That, that was <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. We were gonna so, have, yeah. so relatively, it. we're we're trickling back into rehearsals, and it's kind of I just have to go through the motions of being fucking careful, man. It's a pain in the butt, but you know I really have to protect my father. Yeah, and, and I'm kind of the one that like you know delivers his groceries and all that kind of shit. So, um, you know, uh, we send each other ideas to work on. We all are. We're all working on an idea right now for the Insane Clown Posse. They sent a song over, and we're all kind of getting down on it, having some fun, seeing where it goes. Nice. Uh, so, so yeah, we're you know, it's. I think when we're when we're scattered it's easier to kind of fall off and not talk so much or whatever. But when we get back into, when we're working on projects and back into rehearsals and stuff, we kind of fall back into why we do it. Yeah. It's important to remember that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it gets, it's easy to forget, honestly. Like it's just, it's easy to just let all the bad shit kind of, kind of sour you. And then you have to kind of smack yourself in the face or, or something will come up that'll remind you, you know, it's all about the fans, man. It's all about changing people's life with music. And, and to be able to do that is, is, uh, is, is, it's, it's, it's priceless, man. It's, it's, that is the thing that is yeah. the, the granule, the nucleus, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so, so tell me a little bit more about the whiskey. Like, um, how did you guys choose that location? How did the show come together? What do you have planned? Well, we, we, we have a bit of a relationship with the people at the whiskey just from doing shows in the past with them and, and uh, you know, hanging out at the rainbow or whatever. Like uh, the whiskey has just become kind of this place that like if we're going to Europe or we're leaving on tour, we'll, do, we'll either do a kickoff show at the whiskey or we'll do a welcome home show at the whiskey. It's kind of turned into that situation. Uh, so like I said, the, the relationship was there now because the whiskey has, they're in the business of selling bands. They're a video of their set because they have multiple cameras set up around the venue, uh, like HD cameras that are, you know, positioned at the stage and they can do multiple angles. Um, so basically what they've done is they've taken that, you know, that apparatus and they've they've teamed up with um, this company called Veeps.com, and uh, Veeps basically carries the program and monetizes it. Um, so yeah, it's gonna we're gonna play literally in an empty room. It's gonna be like we'll we'll have two crew guys and a, and a sound guy, and that's literally gonna be kind of it. I think maybe there's a director of some sort that runs the cameras. But it's, it's seriously, like, they told us, like, don't even bring your chicks, like, you know, no wives, no girlfriends, no, no list, nothing. So, um, so we'll go there, we'll play, and it'll be globally broadcast, which is something new for us. So it's, it's Ant Farm history, for sure. I don't think we've ever played a globally broadcast situation. Um, I, we did that Michael Forever tribute from yeah. Cardiff. Uh, that was like a pay-per-view kind of thing, but I don't think it was the same. It was it was a little different, but um, but this should be fun. If it works out conceptually, it should be really cool. I've talked to some of the people that have done it already, or people that watched, and they said it was really cool. So I'm looking forward to it. It's it's fun to play guitar. I like playing guitar on stage, so um, yeah, it'll be nice to at least get to do that. Yeah. Do you, do you guys have, I mean, conversations about what the, you know, future looks like? We're in a really unpredictable time right now where things are opening back up and closing back up and you want to book dates because you want to get the, the venues and everything, but, uh, but it's going to get pushed back. Like what, what does that look like from your, your guys well, perspective? it's just a wait and watch world. That's it. I feel like you can't really, solidify anything because things are changing so rapidly day to day um we are entertaining a an, a an offer for a festival in alaska at the end of august um 
now the only reason I think that's happening is because Alaska is nowhere near a hot spot. Um, I think they had like 40 deaths, and like maybe 200 cases. I don't know. I'm not going to say because I don't know. I just know it was very low and very contained. Obviously, they're pretty contained up there. Um, now, it's it, it raises a lot of feelings and questions. And yeah, we have had a lot of discussions about what the future could look like with our managers and our agents. And and it's all it always comes back to the same thing. There's a lot of ideas, um, but it, we just kind of need to wait and watch and see what how things are going to happen. It's I feel like everybody. I feel like all the bands are watching each other too. You know what I mean? Like okay, they just drop dates, but it's not till twenty one. You know, uh, next year. Uh, so, and, and, you know, you got to deal with like things like thoughts ethically in your head. If, if you're ready to, to put people together like that, if it's the right thing to do, I'm, I'm honestly, it's, it's a bit of a struggle for me. And I also, like I said, um, my father being uh, high risk, I have to consider that. So yeah, you got to take care of yourself. You said it's, you know, all for the fans, but really you need to be there for you and your family and, and your unit yeah. is well that's, that's yeah and my business partners too you know because we can't just sit around and not make money um I, you know and if i if i can't do this show i feel like i could be like pulling you know food off of my partner's tables and out of their kids hands or whatever you know um we'll make it well obviously we're gonna make it but uh these are these are like grandiose questions that we have to face right now and it's it's a little nerve-wracking man just trying to want to do the right thing in in all directions to be honest yeah yeah well terry i want to end with kind of one question uh, because uh you've said that your uh some of your most fulfilling work was playing for the troops um so tell me about kind of what the, uh, that impact has for you and, uh, and what those experiences have been like um yeah uh military contracting uh it is it's a blast honestly i think it's cool i my mom's side of the family is all military air force navy um so i kind of grew up in those settings in a way uh whether it was dependence day cruises on battleships with my uncles or if it was uh air force open houses you know i i i live in where i live in riverside california i could i could hit march it's a it's an air reserve base now but it was an active air force base I could hit it with a rock from my backyard because I'm that close and it's where both of my grandparents were stationed. So I grew up on that base mostly for the most part and going to like open houses. And when you do the open house stuff, you get to go play on military stuff like tanks and troop transports and shit like that, go on the planes. So that's always been fun for me. So whenever I get to do these military contracting um, situations, there's usually more of that. <laughs> so 40, 48 year old me still loves to climb on tanks and, and sit in cockpits. Um, so that stuff's really fun. You know, I, I mean, that's one side of it, but the other side of it is these people, these, these, you know, these troops, these, these, uh, these young people mostly that um, have been stationed so far away from home for so long and and you know they're missing holidays they miss their families they don't get to go to any cool concerts um you know they get to watch youtube <laughs> uh so when you get out there and you kind of feel that they feel forgotten in a way uh that uh, that that's an emotional thing you know i i i, I hate to feel like because they're really like just giving everything up and and laying putting themselves on the line you know uh for 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 us you know for for their country for the all the people in the country for for what the country means etc um and they just feel a little forgotten and you realize that and, and it makes you feel like you really did something special it's more than just like i said like if a song or, or our music like makes somebody happy or or like changes their world a little bit you know, it's it's the same thing, but it's also this person that's been cut off from home for a really long time. Um, so yeah, it, it, the the military work's always been some of my most fulfilling. Yeah, well, that's great, and I mean, obviously, it comes from a you know personal you know uh, joy as well, which is yeah, great. yeah, absolutely. But being able to be there for them and yeah, know, yeah, no, it means a lot. I and and when you meet these troops and stuff, and you talk to them, it's 
it, it really is a high. You, you can you can feel their excitement and and I uh, you know that just drives me to it's, like we said it's one of those things that keeps you going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully, I mean, you guys will get to tour soon. You know, I hopefully. mean, I feel for all the independent venues uh, that are going to be sacrificed. I mean, when this started, I'm, like I said, I'm up in the Bay and the first one I heard about was Slims here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Slims. I played Slims. Yeah. I, cool. I mean, I grew up going to shows in at Slims. It's pivotal in my taste in music is, you know, and just, yeah. it was a blow, you know, that it's just like, it's gone now. And, yeah, I know. I, and, you know, I know everyone from all sides of the spectrum. It's like, I know, you know, dudes that huff, that huff fucking gear for bands, you know, like crew guys that are just sitting at home going, what do, what do I do? Yeah. And then I know, like, I grew up with one of the guys that created Coachella, you know, so like, so like, I see both sides and everything in between. And, and it's literally it's wait wait and watch man i don't know how to sum it up better than those those two words put together wait yeah. and watch world yeah we got to look out for each other so yeah, well, we, yeah but we got to we got to <laughs> yeah but we also got to try and forge new ways too we got to be mindful of that or we're just going to be wondering what the fuck's going on forever that's the thing is uh, the wait and watch you uh, you mentioned it like that it's like okay you're going to put your life in i mean Granted, there's stuff that's out of your control, but you need to kind of, go, you know, not wait aside. There are jobs out there that, you know, need people right now, right? And for sure, we got to got to be flexible. But I, I do feel for everybody that's been impacted. You know? Yeah, it's that's tough, tough, man. I keep seeing, I just see everybody on on TV or around me, and and uh, it's it's hard to kind of get that that knot out of my stomach these days. It's just kind of I'm kind of learning to live with it. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, and and yeah, I mean, you, you remind me of one other thing I did want to talk to you about before we wrap, and that is sure. kind of meditation. You've been you know, meditating a lot. Like, what does what does that look like for you, and how do you get to? It I, I I haven't been like I should. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I've been well. You know, my my meditation time is usually in the morning. I like I like the mornings, um, and it starts my day good because if I go about my day the wrong way, then I have anxiety issues really bad. So if I can start out with some meditation, it's, it's great, man, but it's, it's hard to force yourself. Uh, well, what happens is it's like anything with me, even golf or whatever, you know, like if I get into the groove, it'll be like my daily thing. I want to do it. But if I have one hiccup and miss a few days, it's hard for me to get back into the groove. And lately I've been, my sleep schedule is so freaking all over the place. Like I, uh, one one day I'm getting up at 10 a.m. the ne the next day I'm getting up at 4:30 a.m. You know I just can't sleep a normal schedule, which would you would think I would want to meditate more, mm -hmm. um, but honestly I just it, it it becomes frustrating to where I'll, I'll like get up and like start working on music or something and and uh, but you know that's a friendly reminder that I need to kind of get back into that and and also reading like i haven't been reading a lot i've been reading a little bit um like i have a bathroom book going you know yeah. that I'll, I'll read a piece I, i'm reading the the um the Tao of Wu by rizza which is really it's a small book it's really cool but it's full of like great knowledge so i've been reading that on the toilet um but reading is always a great meditation for me too just i just need to be able to shut everything down for a sec yeah, it's a, have that thing that you find that gives you that consistency, you know. I mean, yeah, 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 and, and it's, I'm, I'm either, I'm either like, I'm either really rolling hard with it, or I'm trying to get it back. I think right now I'm trying to get it back. Yeah, it starts with one day, Terry, and uh, <laughs> I know, right, right. Like tomorrow morning, I should just go for it. I'll just go sit by the fountain and try and dial it in, see if I could do it so much static now it's hard to get it all out you know it's harder it it's harder to just be quiet yeah and but once you start and you find that trend it sounds like we're kind of similar in that like for me it's exercise and so all right. I, have, I have the apple watch right and um, all right so I'm, next month i'm coming up on five years straight of filling the loops on the apple watch every day you know oh, exercise, cool. you know burning calories and all that and having this day you know and so i, I just I got divorced I, I kind of made this decision I'm changing you know some things in, in my life and that's one where I'm just gonna 
focus and take care and be here for my kids. And yeah, everything. yeah. Well, right. I don't have kids, but we're kind of in the same boat. I just divorced last year, so I've been mm -hmm. making all kinds of change because because I was in a I was in a terribly toxic situation, and um, and now I'm to the point where I can't even believe I was in that situation for as long as I was. Um, so you know, I, I think I've made some good change. Um, but there's there's always work to be done. Yeah. Well, tomorrow's the day. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. back into it. Cool, man. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and I appreciate you taking the time. I mean, this was a really great chat of, of learning, you know, about um, how you you got your start and everything. And thank you. Yeah, yeah. Where we're it's at. Good it's good to talk. You know, quarantine. <laughs> yeah, we got the time. Right? <laughs> it's nice, nice to have someone to talk to besides my little dog. Yeah. <laughs> time you want to talk, so. <laughs> Sounds cool, good. Steve. Well, um, tag tag me with the interview when it's all good to go. I'll do that. Yeah, it should be up next week. So I'll uh, I'll tag you in it. And uh, yeah, we look forward to you know when that album is ready coming out. I look forward to checking it out. So killer, man. Thank you, man. Thanks for being cool. Of course, you have a good one, okay? You too, man. Have a good day. Later.